So uh, my name is uh, Leib, uh, I build robots. And uh, we're with the Right Hand Robotics, uh, who's doing intelligent uh, order booking systems. Just a question for you guys. How many of you ordered something online in the last month? How many of you wish that when you did order things online, it took longer, it was more expensive, or it was you got the wrong item more frequently? So uh, we're making systems that make sure that as you're shipping items, this can be done effectively. Uh, I did my PhD in uh, the biorobotics lab at Harvard where uh, our team originally met. And uh, we've been studying this now for a number of years, I guess. And one of the interesting, uh, today, one of the interesting questions is, you know, you say, hey, you build robots, the first question you get is, well, are robots going to take over the world? Are they going to take over my job? Are they going to have tremendous income? And uh, the uh, question is really an interesting one. And so today I'll be talking a little bit about Answer to the first question is, are we building Terminator? Answer to that is, uh, that's a really complicated philosophical one, uh, not in scope for 15 minutes. Are robots taking over jobs? Are robots taking, changing the way that the world works and having impact? Well, second is kind of a function of the first. And so I'm gonna be sharing some of the lessons that we've been learning as we've been taking this technology out to doing real things because at the moment, the more robots that we have on the world doing useful tasks and really creating value for society, uh, the more successful everyone is. And so uh, we'll be sharing some of the things that we've learned in the industrial robotics space. Because the answer when you say, will robots take over the world, is actually they're already there. And a really interesting piece of this is how and where. So recently, the Roomba from iRobot passed 10 million in sales on one of the most uh, popular robots that's ever been sold. Uh, other parts of the world, we've seen news that uh, Guangzhou province in China has an official program to try and automate uh, half of their, uh, or all of, I think, their uh, factories there. It's got government subsidies and things like that. And you look worldwide, and there's about 71 billion that's uh, spent on robotics and services, uh, a couple of other things, in 2015. Interesting thing here is that about as much is spent on the services as it is on the systems itself. I'll get back to that in a little while. At the same time, we also have research that's coming out new ways of doing things that are also changing the world. Uh, we've got ways of building inexpensive uh, insect-sized robots based on pop-up technology. We've got ways of pooling learning from all sorts of different robots together. We've got ways of uh, robots on the lower right-hand side. This is a group of MIT that's been teaching them how to try and move rubble away from doors and things. If they ever try and come after you, hold up a mirror. Robots are still pretty dumb. Uh, we've got things where people are understanding how do you, for the first time, we can actually have robots that reduce the metabolic cost of walking. This is actually a group that was downstairs from us. Uh, really funny, we'd come into the lab late at night and all the grad students would be dressed up in spandex demoing the systems out. No photos, no photos, no photos. So uh, not only is it changing the research, it's also changing the investment space. There's about a, almost a billion dollars that were invested in robotics last year. Uh, a couple of large investments in the medical space, a couple of large investments in the drone space. And most of the rest has been split about equally between consumer and industrial robots. Uh, our background, our target space is really industrial robots. And so that's what we'll be talking about uh, today. Uh, our team originally started out, we were in a DARPA challenge trying to get more effective robot hands for the military. And so a bunch of people were really frustrated about how do you try and have an uh, effective hand that can actually disarm IEDs without taking 20 minutes like the existing ones can do so. And what our research really showed was that you need two things that are important. You've gotta have smart mechanics, so the mechanism is simplifying the grasping problem. If you take your thumb, you'll notice that you can actually roll it pretty easily, even though you can't voluntarily control that motion. You also need to have sensor feedback so you can learn what you're, what's working. So you had this cool technology, and said, well, what happened if we try and take this out to industry? And the structure of the industry is really what's interesting, and as we have more and more robotics companies trying to take good research out and do useful things with it, this is one of the things that uh, we wish that we would have probably known uh, more about at the start. So in the, in the industrial robotics industry, also in the logistics industry, the industry is structured with system integrators in the center. Many companies that build OEM uh, components, ARMS are built by the big four, Hanuk, ABB, Yaskawa, KUKA, giant multinational conglomerates that sell thousands and thousands of ARMS. Other people build cameras, build software systems, things like that. And then system integrators take all these components, put them together, and do the fiddly bits that are needed to make it a specific solution to a specific customer. Because none of the customers have in-house the technology and the ability to try and configure this to their own uh, solution. Now what's interesting is if you start looking into the details on that, these are actually the most important things to try and, making a, to try and make a successful, scalable business. 
Because taking, for example, a uh, hypothetical uh, installation in, say, the automotive space, if you look at what the economics of it are, workers at about $100,000 a year, logistics industry that's probably thirty or $40,000, say you've got two shifts running, you want a two-year payback, system value is half a million, you're doubling the throughput, it could be a million dollars instead. And of that, the cost of the arm itself is actually not so much. Cost of a typical industrial arm is about $40,000. Some of them are a little bit more, some of them are a little bit less. Most of the cost is actually the integration, where there's going to be people trying to configure it for this little piece, this little piece, this little piece, design a custom gripper, and set it up so that it solves a full problem. And this variation is really the thing that's the important thing that new advances in robotics are making easier. Uh, and this is an example, if you're imagining an integrator trying to put a system like this together, you've got a big industrial arm, you've got some custom end of arm tooling that's able to handle these sacks of flour, feed, or whatever it is, you've got a bunch of conveyors that are in place, and the guy has to try and design the end of arm tooling, has to program it for here's how it's going to move, and has to install it and have it running. And now the new people looking at this problem have said, well, if that's the expensive part, let's try and make this simpler. And so there's a whole new industry that is called collaborative robots, where the goal is to try and make it as simple as possible for other people to try and set these systems up, and they change the business model. So rather than having integrators try and put the systems together, they can have the end customers do this themselves. And so you have things like the, like the uh, universal robots on the left, this is a Danish company, they make a system that's really simple to try and install, and it's human safe. So now instead of needing an integrator to try and handle the variation from one job to the next, they can use the same guy that's programming a CNC mill to program it to set it up so that the CNC mill can run independently and autonomously. Uh, they exited last year to Teradyne for $350 million. Uh, really, really nice systems. Uh, another group that's doing a similar sort of thing is Rethink Robotics. Uh, they've set a lot of the, the vision for the market, though uh, their products have taken a little while longer to try and take off. They're doing things in the circuit testing space where you can have a simple system, end person can program it, set it up, and there's a lot of interest in these over in China right now. Uh, across both of these, the big difference is really who has to try and set up the system. Now instead of having to sell through integration partners, I can sell through value-added distributors that just sell the robot on and someone else can try and set it up. Same thing's happening as well with newer technologies coming out. There's a really cool group over Germany, Franca, that has this uh, Emeka robot that they're uh, advertising right now at a, a 10,000 euro list price. So this is gonna come in and totally change the way that people do assembly and manufacturing. You've seen the same sort of thing as well in the logistics industry though. So uh, if you look at an automation, trying to put an automation to try and solve the labor uh, shortages that most people in the industry are facing, old way of doing it is you'll have some integrator comes in, puts in miles and miles of conveyor belts, put in a giant automated storage retrieval system. Everything that you see in the back there is all sorts of totes filled with inventory. The conveyors will bring them down to this pick station, so I'm gonna lift them out and put it onto there. Kiva Robotics came in uh, and they realized, well, look, we can have systems and robots that can actually handle the variation from one robot, one warehouse to the next automatically. And they can also handle the variation from where is your inventory stored relative to where the order volume is. So you can optimize your whole order volume based on what's moving quickly versus what's not, remove the travel time, and They've been extremely, extremely successful. Uh, Amazon's latest released figures after they acquired the company are 30,000 robots in the fields. It's actually much more than that uh, if you remove the, uh, the latency there. And what's interesting here is again, you're using new technology to try and handle the challenges of setting up from one customer to the next customer to the next customer, unless you do new things as well. So for example, they had one installation where they wanted to have a warehouse in one location if you tried to move the ASRS, that's gonna be millions and millions of dollars to tear it out, and then millions to put in a new one. With a system like this, you can set it up in one place, move the pods, the robots slowly move following, and you can actually do that over a weekend. So really, really interesting technology. And new technology, again, to solving the, the difference from one to the next. Another thing that we're also seeing moving in the industry as well is people are trying to start charging this as a service rather than as something that's an upfront investment. This is a really cool group called uh, called uh, Blue River Technologies, and they do lattice thinning robots. And so for them, what they do is they have a system that's dragged behind a tractor, there's a little computer vision system in that trailer that's looking down at the lattice. And for lettuce to germinate, you need to have a bunch of different uh, seeds that are close together. But once it starts to grow, they tend to crowd each other out. So the traditional way of doing this is that you have someone come in with a hoe, hack at it, and thin it out. This sort of system can do it now 
uh, automatically, and again using the uh, using the, the technology itself to try and change. Well, this this uh, plant versus the next plant versus the next plant versus the next plant, and because it's charged as a service. Uh, it's able to be something that the, the farmers don't need to put in a bunch of capital to try and do. They can actually uh, they can actually just hire it like they would an existing existing force. Since there's not so much variation that the uh, the robot is able to handle variation from one field to the next, they're able to install it effectively and it runs from there. A couple of other people are also using this across the industry right now. Uh, Fetch Robotics uh, has their systems out charged on a per service model. They're targeting also the logistics industry where they're trying to remove the amount of time it takes to travel to and from inventory as you're doing the pack out. And uh, it's also the NVIDIA robotics guys are trying to do the same thing. Again, this is trying to reduce the cost of, uh, the, cost of uh, the cost of the customer. The reason that this is at all possible is that the setup cost isn't so large that you have to really make sure that you've got a stake in the ground. You can install a system, figures out where to navigate. Navigation is now a pretty, uh, pretty solid, uh, solid uh, solution and it's able to handle that from there. One of the big things that's really important for being able to understand what variation is important to handle though, is the access to the customers themselves. In the industrial space, most of the people are extremely busy, and you'll talk to a warehouse manager where he has three people breathing down his neck if no order, go if an order is missed on a given day, he's gotta try and apologize to the customer, this is why it didn't happen. And so if you have a new technology coming and you say this is gonna be a promise of doing something new, uh, be cheaper, be faster, et cetera, et cetera. That spool up time to try and understand how is it going to uh, affect my operation, when is it going to start uh, delivering that is really, really important. And so another thing that people are trying to do as they're taking technology out for the research labs is forming those first initial customer connections is also extremely important with people who are forward thinking enough to try and actually do this. Uh, Fellow Robotics has a collaboration with uh, Lowe's Hardware they have a really interesting system that's able to navigate around the different stores and tell you where inventor which inventory is on the shelves to the store, and to the customer, they'll tell you where do I find the inventory. So when I walk in, I can try and tap on a thing and say, okay, great, this is where it goes. Uh, Locus Robotics actually started out originally as one of Kiva's first customers, and they have a partnership with Quiet Logistics, which is a 3PL in the area. So as they've been developing their technology, they've been able to actually get that on the ground with that prototype quickly, because for new technology coming out of a lab, in the industrial space, it's typically not enough to have it something exciting. You have to have it something that's, uh, there's a little bit more for people willing to, uh, to risk uh, actually uh, working with things. Now, the really interesting thing is, as you look at trying to set up a system from one place to the next place to the next place, whether you're configuring a uh, integrated system across a given workflow, whether you're trying to go from one customer's task to the next customer's task, machines are learning how to handle variation themselves automatically with machine learning and uh, large data approaches. Facebook is now able to recognize the fact that I'm not my brother most of the time. Uh, it's also able to, Siri's able to understand the difference between my crazy mangled Minnesotan accent and my co-founder's uh, Russian-Israeli one. Uh, we've got systems that are out driving on the ground and uh, they're able to handle the variation from the roads in the middle of the country to the roads in the city, most part. And the advantage here is for robotics as we're trying to move from interesting technology to application in the, in the real world, we have this opportunity to have scalable problems where the machines are doing the hard part of configuring from one part to the next. And so rather than having to have a system integrator come in and try to configure, here's where one toad is, here's where the next toad is, here's where the next toad is in a warehouse, we can use computer vision to recognize. Here's this setup, this setup, this setup, this setup. You can use a much, much faster try and setup. It also opens you up to new tasks. In our, cases, in our case, this is handling individual items. So in a factory, I can afford to have someone come in and spend months setting up a system to handle a specific item that's presented the same way. In logistics applications, Amazon has 70 million different SKUs in their warehouses. Typical grocery store has 45,000 different SKUs. All of them are different sizes, different shapes, different weights. And so that technique doesn't work. On the other hand, there's an enormous amount of pain here, where as we've been talking to the customers, no one is able to find the people that they're able to need to actually do the task. We thought originally this would be something where people would want it faster, they'd want it cheaper. What we found is that they actually can't find the people at all. So we were talking to one large uh, distribution manager in California. They were complaining how after the football games, they'd have a third of their workforce wouldn't be coming in. They'd be happy to pay more and have better people. Uh, but that's not what they're able to find for the jobs because it's pretty, uh, pretty rote work. We have another customer that was talking out how for them, Picking in a piece level fulfillment warehouse is over 50% of their costs. 
and the workforce is all aging. And so for them, people that used to be 20 years old are now 40 years old, and they're not being replaced with the, the new generation because the millennials don't want to work in warehouses. So I'm uh, happy to show you some videos. I probably won't do that on the, on the uh, screen here and on the recording, but if you're interested in seeing some of the stuff we're working on, uh, feel free to, to uh, bug me afterwards. And with that, open it up to any questions. Great, so tell us maybe more about the company then, what, uh, what you're actually building to the extent you can talk about it. Absolutely, so uh, what we're building as a company is we're building systems that can handle individual items for order fulfillment. If you imagine there's a warehouse, there's many technologies you can use to travel to the goods. No one's been able to pick the items themselves. So we're putting together machine learning, uh, computer vision, uh, and the end effector itself to try and create full solutions that can solve the picking task. Right now you look at robots, they can see, they can navigate, they can move, but they can't interact with the world around them, they can't handle varied items. And so that's the focus of us as a company. In fact, if you look at our logo, uh, the logo is a hand reaching down towards an object. Now that you see it, you can't unsee it. Yes. Hi. Um, so I like the idea of you like uh, showing us how you can uh, like basically pick product by SKUs. Have you guys, how far have you guys gotten into like uh, computer vision and looking in the world and seeing what people are using and then using it to predict um, like what a warehouse might order. So, so basically like how far have you gotten into predictive ordering? So there's a bunch of people that are targeting uh, data-driven uh, demand prediction. One of the big trends in the fulfillment industry is you're trying to get more parts closer to the people to cut shipping times. So there's a bunch of people doing that. Uh, that's not really our focus as a company. We do focus mostly on the, on the picking stuff. I don't know if I understood the question properly. Hi there. Um, <clears throat> so we're obviously quite, well, maybe not obviously, uh, way away from um, uh, robots completely scaling and taking over all this manual labor. While working in the industry, what do you see in terms of the future over the next um, two, three, five years? You know, a company like Amazon isn't going to abandon their manual labor force and, and you know, the bigger political philosophical questions. Um, so how do you see things progressing as your product scale, as more companies try to integrate um, robotics? So the thing that was interesting as we were studying the problem is for most of the warehouses we talked to, they're having trouble finding enough people to do the scaling. They actually have to open up a second location. We were talking to one group down in North Carolina. They had to split their operation between two different facilities because they weren't able to find the people within the commuting distance for the task. And so what we've seen is a demographic shift where the people don't actually want to do this type of work. And so the, custom, the companies are actually more interested in understanding how do I try and scale beyond that. A robot's not able to ever replace the capabilities of someone who's able to think about cause and effect and is really dedicated. It's, we're, we're not there yet. Robots are pretty dumb still. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.